What a joy to worship together, to take the Word of God and to hear God speak to us as we worship Him in the unity of the Spirit. There's just nothing like it. And if I've learned anything in the past year and a half, it's, it's to enjoy what we have here as we worship together. Our text today is in 2 Corinthians chapter 2. As we're reading Paul's letter to the church at Corinth, they are his problem child. There's been a breach somewhat in their relationship. There have been some teachers who've come in that have, in essence, seduced them with their flash and their charismatic appeal. There's been someone in the church there that caused Paul some trouble that has now repented. Paul has told them they need to forgive this man and, and move on. And he's explaining to them why he didn't fo follow through on his intention to come and visit them. And he's given them the circumstances. And as he explains to them why he made the decisions he made, it's going to transition from Paul talking about the very specific uh, incident of him not coming to see them when he had intended to, to him giving a defense, an extended defense, if you will, of his apostleship itself, and explaining that it is God who called him and commissioned him. And we're in that passage that really is that hinge between these two parts, between his defense of his decision into his defense of his apostleship. Read with me beginning in verse 12. <clears throat> of chapter two, the apostle Paul under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit writes, when I came to Troas to preach the gospel of Christ, even though a door was open for me in the Lord, my spirit was not at rest because I did not find my brother Titus there. So I took leave of them and went on to Macedonia. But Thanks be to God who in Christ always leads us in triumphal procession and through us spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of him everywhere. For we are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To one, a fragrance from death to death. To the other, a fragrance from life to life, who is sufficient for these things? For we are not like so many peddlers of God's word, but as men of sincerity, as commissioned by God, in the sight of God, we speak in Christ. <clears throat> you know, I am blessed to get to travel and preach and people's invitation a lot uh, these days at, at, at 61, uh, it's quite a joy. But man, I remember, I can remember the very first time anybody offered to fly me to come preach somewhere. Uh, that was a big deal. I can tell you specifically, it was uh, in 1988. Tanya and I, well, I was in seminary. We lived in a little cotton field in uh, eastern Arkansas there in, in, on the Delta across the river from Memphis. And man, it was a big deal. A guy named Jim Washer invited me to come to Hollywood, Florida and preach a revival for him at, the, at his church. Man, it, it was such a big deal. Tanya, I don't, I, I'm just, I can remember this. She dressed up, got the boys dressed up to drive me to the airport. And I can remember when I came home, she got dressed up, dressed the boys up. At Seth, I think it was Michael's first day of school when I came back. And and uh, had Seth holding a sign, welcome home, dad. I mean, it was like a big deal. I never got invited to go anywhere to preach like that. And here I was, uh, 28 years old, and I got to get on a plane in Memphis, Tennessee and fly to Miami. And he picked me up at the airport. And man, I mean, he treated me like a king. Uh, I can remember the first night he said, what do you like to eat? I said, man, I like anything but liver and onions. He said, no, what do you really, really, really like? I said, well, I like seafood. Well, what kind of seafood? Do you like lobster? I said, I love lobster. He said, let's go get lobster. We went out and we got lobster. I finished that first one. He said, you want another one? I said, are you kidding me? He said, no, let's get you another one. And I, I ate two lobsters. Uh, and then the next night he said, you like steak? I said, I love steak. What kind of steak do you like? Ribeye. Oh, I know the place that's got ribeye. He took me out. Every night it was like that. About the third night, he said, let me tell you why I, I asked you to come down here. 
he said, uh, I, I think the Lord's leading me to retire. And I think you would be great to be my successor here at the church here in Hollywood, Florida. I said, let me pray about that. The next night, we got surf and turf. It was steak and lobster. It was, it was everything. <laughs> but man, I'd prayed about that all night long. I was just like, I, I just, I, I didn't feel right. I, I felt like I needed to finish seminary. I thought I knew what God would do with my life even after seminary where I would go and stuff. And that next night, he said, have you thought about it? I said, yeah. I said, uh, man, I, I just don't have any peace about it that that's what I ought to do. He said, are you sure? I said, I'm sure. He said, well, tomorrow night, it's Burger King. <laughs> True to his word, we ate at Burger King the next night. I figured out what that was about. You know, Paul is at one of those moments where he's, he has faced a door of opportunity that's wide open to him. It's, it's not a bad thing. He's not making a choice between good and bad. He's got to choose between good and best. What is the Lord's will for me in this? He, he said he came to Troas, and there's this great door of opportunity. We, we don't know what that looks like. Perhaps there was a group of believers there that said, we'll support you if you'll stay here and preach and help us plant a church, build up the body of Christ in Troas. Whatever it was, something was clearly a great opportunity for him. But he said when he came there, even though there was a, a door of opportunity that's open in the Lord, it's not like Satan did this. It's not that this was a bad thing, but he said my spirit was not at rest. Because I, I didn't find my brother Titus there. Apparently he and Titus had arranged to meet somewhere there in, the, in Troas, but Titus didn't show, Paul didn't know what that meant. He, he did not feel like he could take this opportunity and stay there and preach. He, his spirit was restless. Even though there's this great opportunity before him, he just didn't feel like that was what God would have him do. You know, we may have a restless spirit even though we have an open door. It's an important concept for us as believers to know that not every open door of opportunity is the will of God. There are gonna be a lot of good things in your life that you could do. It wouldn't be wrong for you to do them, but it's not the fit God has for you. It's not the thing God has for you. Just because God owns the door and he shows you the door, and just because God wants someone to walk through that door and to do it, doesn't mean he wants you to do it. And when we're in that moment where we're, we're caught between a good opportunity in which we are convinced we could honor God and do good things, and yet there's this restlessness of spirit. I, I'm not sure that's what God wants me to do, we'll have moments of doubt. We might even have moments of fear. Now, I want to be clear here that in this world with all of its fallenness and with our clouded thinking, I think it's right for us to understand that not every feeling of doubt or fear is inherently sinful. Uh, you can be fearful and still obedient. You can be doubtful and still obedient. The, the feeling is what the feeling is. The question is whether or not you're controlled by the feelings. And this is what Paul is showing us. He's, he's opening the door of his own heart and psyche and let, letting us see in that he's facing this circumstance in which the door of opportunity is wide open. It's a door opened in the Lord, he says, but he's got this restless spirit. How do you know the will of God? Now, there are people who teach the will of God like it's playing a game of pin the tail on the donkey. That, you know, uh, I, and I hear people say, like, I hope I don't miss the will of God on this, as though if you make the wrong decision, even though you are trying to do the right thing and want to do the right thing, if you make the wrong decision, then you will have blown it and you'll never recover. People talk about, oh, I just want to be in the center of God's will, as though somehow you can be on the periphery of God's will instead of right where he wants you. I, I, 
I want you to understand what it means to know the will of God. How do you know the will of God? I think there are four clear steps to really knowing the will of God. And it's more than just having an open door of opportunity. The very first thing is you have to desire Christ's glory above all else. You cannot and will not discern God's will if that is not your grand purpose. If you have any other purpose, if it's your happiness or you being some great preacher or teacher or, or man or woman or boss or whatever, if your purpose is success, if, if it's happiness, it's just not gonna work. As a believer, your life really gets simple. Now, simple's not easy. It's not the same thing, but it is simple. Most of our decisions are already made for us if we're believers. You don't have to pray about a lot of things. You don't have to wonder about a lot of things. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't get up this morning and say, wonder if I'm going to church. I don't have to wonder if God wants me to be generous. I don't have to wonder if God wants me to be kind to, to Tanya. Most of the time, I don't have to wonder if I need to apologize to her. There's just a lot of things I don't have to wonder about. Christ already made those decisions. But I'm not going to discern God's will if my purpose is anything other than his glory. So you've got to begin there, that the very purpose of my existence as, a, as one who's been redeemed by the Lord Jesus Christ is to bring honor and glory to him. That's my purpose. And when that becomes your purpose, every decision is both discerned and made based on that grand purpose. Can I do this and bring glory to Christ? And if the answer is no, I, I, I can't, there's no way I can do that and really claim to be Christ honoring and glorifying. Well, then that decision is made for you. You don't even have to make that decision. You, you start there with a desire to do to bring glory to Christ above all else. And then secondly, you do God's revealed will. Now when I say that, I'm talking about the things that God has clearly spoken in his word. Now, inherent and implicit in this step is your knowledge of scripture. You can't know God's revealed will if you're not in the book. It's here that God reveals to us what our homes should look like, the way we should act on our jobs, the way we should have a generous spirit, the character qualities that we should exhibit, the way, what the fruit of the spirit in our lives looks like. And anything in my life that does not look like the Christ revealed in scripture, then I need to eliminate. So I have to know God's revealed will, what he clearly teaches, through knowing his word. And once I know it, then I, I must do it. I don't, I don't have to pray about whether or not to strive for unity in the church. We, we just heard the command to do that, strive for unity in the church. I don't have to pray uh, uh, about whether or not to gather with the church. I don't have to pray about giving because God has revealed in his word. My friend Jim Scott Oreck said, we are to live according to God's revealed will, not according to his secret will. His secret will may be the rock of our comfort, but his revealed will is the rule of our conduct. And that is precisely correct. There's a lot about God's will we may not know. God never had a verse in the book of Malachi that said, Herschel York, go pastor Buck Run. There was not a verse in the book of Ruth that said, Tanya Sharp, Mary Herschel York. Those things come out of knowing God's revealed will and then trusting him in the secret things. That, and, and yet, there's such a comfort in knowing that when we are doing his revealed will, then this leads us to the third step, which we can prayerfully use sanctified common sense. In other words, based on my desire to bring glory to Christ and based on my knowledge of his word, what he has clearly revealed, then I'm evaluating things. What is the best opportunity for me to bring glory to Christ? What fits 
best with his revealed will? What fits best with the way he shaped me, my spiritual gifts, my heart, my, uh, my experiences, my personality? And using those things, I make my best decision based on those things that I know. You pray about it. You say, Lord, my desire in this decision is to bring honor and glory to you. Now, how do I do that? And uh, I, I saw one of our members, Enoch Welch, put on Facebook this week that he is retiring as a basketball coach. I know Enoch well enough to know he prayed about that. He asked questions, Lord, what's the best thing here? And he made that decision based on how it affected his family and what, what, what would be the most Christ-honoring thing in his life. That's precisely what we do. There's no verse that says, Enoch, coach basketball. Enoch, don't coach basketball. It is prayerful common sense, looking at what God has shown us about himself, about ourselves, about the opportunities we have, and praying through it, and using sanctified common sense. Not human wisdom, but wisdom that is filtered through the truth of Scripture and prayer. Oswald Chambers said, we can always tell whether our will is what we ask by the way we live when we are not praying. Sometimes we go to the Lord, we say, oh Lord, make me glorify you. And then our lives show that that's not really what we want. We're not doing the things to make, bring glory to Christ. When you pray, ask yourself, am I living like that really is the desire of my heart? And then finally, you just trust God's providence. Once you have glorified, you've made your desire to glorify Christ preeminent, you've read the word, you've prayed and made your best decision, then trust God that he's not going to let you do the wrong thing. Can you imagine, can you even imagine that you would pray to God in sincerity saying, Lord, my great desire here is to bring honor and glory to Christ. And he would say, well, I'm not gonna tell you how to do that. I'm not gonna let you do that. If that really is your desire, that's when the Holy Spirit really takes notice. When you pray, Lord, make me a great preacher, Holy Spirit is not interested. When you pray, Lord, let me be wealthy so I can do some good in this world with my wealth, the Holy Spirit doesn't care about that. When you say, Lord, I, want, I just want to be a good parent, and that's your primary desire, the Holy Spirit's not interested in that. As good as all those things may be, it's only when you say, Lord, I want to bring honor and glory to Jesus that's when the Holy Spirit says, is that what you want? Because that's what I'm all about, is pointing to him and bringing glory to him. And if that is what you want with your life, I will let you do that. And I will help you do that. And I will make sure that you don't make the decisions that would keep you from doing that. You trust God's providence. Once you have surrendered to his will, Trust that he'll work it out in your life. And this is what Paul does. He says, there's an open door of opportunity, but it wasn't for me to go through. My spirit was restless. But it's here that he, he turns. Even though he's in this moment, he was in this moment of restless spirit, open door of opportunity. He says, I, I took my leave of those dear brothers and sisters there in Troas I departed from there. They may have seen that as a rejection. The Corinthians certainly misunderstood it because they judged him for it, that he didn't come on to them. But look what he says here in this next verse. But thanks be to God, who in Christ always leads us in triumphal procession and through us spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of him everywhere. Now here's the good news. Even when others misunderstand you, even when your spirit is restless, even when you're not certain about the decisions that you have just made, the good news is that Christ always leads us in a triumphal procession, even when we may feel like we are in retreat. Paul here is, is sort of, 
backing away from his plans. It, he, he can't find Titus. He's restless in spirit. He leaves and no one understands why he makes the decision that he makes. But when he does it, he says, here's the good news. In spite of how that felt, Christ always leads us in a triumphal procession. Now, what's this about? I don't know if you're old enough to have watched, uh, seen the movie Cleopatra with uh, Elizabeth Burton and Richard Burton. Uh, but there's a scene in there where Cleopatra enters Rome. Uh, she comes to present uh, her child to Caesar, that is their, their child, uh, at least ostensibly, and she leads this grand entrance into Rome. And that was a really common thing in Rome. Often, in fact, usually, it was when a general had defeated an enemy and then he came with his armies, he would enter the city and all the city would turn out to see this triumphal procession. The conquering general leading his forces that had won the battle, they would often have among them either in shackles or sometimes even in cages. The defeated generals, the slaves that they had captured. And as they came through the streets of the city, they would bestow gifts, the, the booty taken in battle, things that they had taken from the land that they had conquered. And they would give to the people standing around, giving gifts while they processed through the town. And that's in the passage that uh, Pastor Adrian read to us about when Jesus ascended up on high, what was he doing? He was leading in triumphal procession. He led his captives, he led captivity captive. He, he entered heaven declaring that he had won the victory and he gave gifts to his church. Some apostles and some prophets and, and some pastors and teachers. Why? So that the church might have everything it needs to worship and honor him. And this is why Paul, using that same image here in 2 Corinthians, he says, no matter what you're feeling, no matter what you are experiencing, Christ always leads us in triumphal procession, even though we might feel in re retreat. The subjective experience, what we feel, might indeed alter our, our feelings but it should not touch our faith. You might be in that moment of fear and doubt. As long as you maintain your desire and your purpose to bring honor and glory to Christ, then you need to live in that knowledge, not in what you feel. And when Paul says this to the church at Corinth, He's saying it with a history between them. They have, in essence, seen him sometimes at his worst. They've, they've received his severe letter. This is at least the fourth letter they've received from him. The letter we call 1 Corinthians is actually his, at least his second letter to them. Turn back, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. And look at verse 9. And look at the way Paul describes what he is feeling in this first epistle to the church at Corinth. He said, for I think that God has exhibited us apostles as last of all, like men sentenced to death, because we've become a spectacle to the world, to angels and to men. He, Paul says there, it's like he's paraded around, put on display in front of the world and angels and all humanity as a spectacle of death. We are fools for Christ's sake but you are wise in Christ. We are weak, but you're strong. You are held in honor, but we are held in disrepute. To the present hour, we hunger and thirst. We're, we're poorly dressed and buffeted and homeless, and we labor working with our own hands. When reviled, we bless. When persecuted, we endure. When slandered, we entreat. We have become and are still like the scum of the world, the refuse of all things. You see the paradox? Paul loves this kind of paradox. He, he uses it a lot in 2 Corinthians. That even though before the world, he's like the scum of the earth. 
He's mistreated and, and he looks defeated often. But in reality, the objective reality is not what he's feeling or what he is experiencing there on earth. The objective reality is our position in Christ. And that does not change. That is what Jesus has accomplished for us. We sang it. Did you hear the words? Christ has defeated every sin. Cast all your burdens now on him. Do you believe that? But is it not true that tomorrow morning you'll be struggling with sin? There's the subjective feeling. I'm struggling here. I'm finding it hard to be the scum of the earth, to be rejected by people, to, to struggle with my own feelings, my alienation, my loneliness, my uh, whatever I'm feeling, I, it, it's hard. And, and that's the subjective experience. But at the same time, at that very moment, in your weakest moment, your greatest struggle, your, your, your deepest sorrow, your, your most intense pain to know that the objective truth is that Jesus is leading me right now in a triumphal procession. I am not hoping for heaven. I am already seated there in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. We, we feel our present circumstances, but but we have to live our position in Christ. And the Christian life is that daily conscious decision to live what we know rather than what we feel. It is an act of surrender. It is an act of discipline. It is an act of spirit and of mind. It is an act of dependence on the spirit. Uh, why are we obedient in baptism? When we're baptized, we're declaring that the reality about me is that the old me has been crucified with Christ and buried. And there's a new me that has risen to walk in a new way of life. And even though I am still in this world, I am dead to it. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That's the object of reality. The Lord's Supper. Why do we partake the Lord's Supper? What are we saying? We're saying, in spite of my struggles, in spite of my feelings, the reality is that I have partaken of Christ. I have feasted on who he is. And it doesn't matter that I have been hurt and wounded and abused and someone has left me and someone has ignored me and the world has rejected me. The truth is I am feasting on Christ. Why does church membership matter? Because it's my declaration that in spite of the times that I feel alone and afraid, I am part of something much bigger than myself. It's why the Holy Spirit leads us to make those conscious decisions to obey, to follow Christ in baptism and church membership and the ordinances. I've been thinking a lot this week about my brothers and sisters in Cuba. I, I've been there. I, I have, oh man, I, I'll never forget preaching to a group of 400 pastors off on some hidden up in some farm uh, in Cuba. And, and man, as I was teaching through the letters of the, to the seven churches of, in Revelation, I, I, I thought of the words of Christ, uh, how you, you're small, yet I've opened a great and effective door for you. But then when I got to the church of Laodicea, and Jesus said, you're neither hot nor cold, and I would spew you out of your mouth. I began to think of the church in America. I began to weep in front of my Cuban brothers. And one of them stood up 
with all the persecution they have faced, with all they have lost, many in that room have spent time in prison for preaching the gospel. And one of them stood up and said, Dr. York, let us pray for the United States of America. And they all got on their faces, Cuban pastors, crying out to God for my country when I've never suffered one iota compared to what they've suffered. And their obedience reflects that they know who they are in Christ more than they know the persecution of any dictatorship. This is the secret of our strength and weakness. This is what Paul is driving at. Their big criticism of him is how weak he is and how unimpressive he is. But he's saying that even in our brokenness, we are a pleasing aroma of Christ, even though, he says to some, we're the stench of death. When Paul says that Christ always leads us in triumphal procession, and through us, he spreads the fragrance of the aroma of, God, of Christ to God. He, he's picturing, once again, that victory parade. They would come in, and they would be burning incense, and, uh, and, and it would be a pleasing aroma to the crowd that had gathered to welcome them. But it, this is also the language of sacrifice, isn't it? In the tabernacle and in the temple, there are fragrant offerings symbolizing, I think, often the prayers of the saints that ascend up to the nostrils of God. And Paul says that through Christ, God has made us this, this pleasing aroma to him. That God, it's like a mother will hug her child, and what will she do? Every mother knows what it's like to smell your child, and Every one of your children has a different smell. And to just breathe them in and know this, this is mine. This is, this is what God does with us. When he gathers me in his arms, Herschel smells like Jesus to me. Not because of anything I've done, not because of my faithfulness, but because Christ has redeemed me. I am accepted in him. He makes me the pleasing aroma of Christ to God. We're always the aroma of Christ to God. It's not based on our doubts or our fears or our failures or our goodness or our successes. It's based on what Jesus has done for us. Now, he also says that we are sometimes the aroma of life to those who are being saved. That as we go about our life in this world, seeking to bring honor and glory to Christ, being sanctified by his spirit, walking in the revelation of his word and seeking to do his revealed will, trusting his Holy Spirit to lead us in those secret things. And as we reflect the character of Christ, those people around us who are, notice the present tense, being saved. What a beautiful description. Salvation is God's continuing work in us. Yes, there's a sense in which we can say, I have been saved and I am saved, but there's also another sense in which we can say, I am being saved. It's a progressive work, isn't it? And to those that are being saved, we are the aroma of Christ. They, they get it too. They go... And Dave Parks, he smells like Jesus. Stan, and I like being around that guy, he reminds me of Christ. Oh, Dusty Rhodes, man, I love being around him. He, he just always joyful in the Lord. I, I like that. Tanya, what a pleasing fragrance of Jesus she is in my life, in my home. I could go on and on and on. This, this is what God does with us. When we seek to emulate Christ, we're, we're the fragrance of life unto life that others, they, they catch a whiff of Jesus on us and it encourages them and it makes them want to follow Christ and it makes them be more like Jesus. And 
They go from the life of Christ in us to a deeper life with Christ in themselves. But we're sometimes the aroma of death to those who are perishing. The same odor. Some smell it and go, oh, that's life. That's Jesus. Other smell go, oh, that's death. That's Jesus. You cannot be more fragrant than to have the aroma of Christ. Now listen to me. You will be tempted to make the aroma your own. You'll be tempted to let people see you. You'll be tempted to change the word of God and the will of God to adapt to the world's standards in order to be more accommodating to them. There are people who get a whiff of what we preach right here in the Buckland Baptist Church and they go, that's death. And if you try and lessen the truth and the impact of the word of God in order to adjust to what the world thinks of the aroma of Christ, you'll lose Christ. It'll be about you. But when you are willing to just say, I am just going to let the Holy Spirit decide who is being saved and who's perishing. I'm just going to be the savor, the sweet aroma of Christ in this world. And the results will be up to him. That's precisely what Paul says here. We are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing to one a fragrance from death to death to the other a fragrance from life to life. And then he asks this question, who is sufficient for these things? Now this is the first little dig Paul puts in here at these false teachers because they have come in claiming their competence. That these guys, are they're trained in this. They're they're competent to minister. And that Paul, he's weak. and Oh, his letters are weighty, but his presence is weak. Here's Paul going, look, those guys aren't sufficient for this. No one is sufficient for this. Who, who is sufficient to be the fragrance of life unto life for some and the fragrance of death unto death for others? We are sincere proclaimers of the word even though many are self-promoting peddlers of the word. Look, he said, we're not like so many peddlers of God's word, but as men of sincerity, as commissioned by God. I don't often recommend podcasts, but I'm gonna tell you one you need to listen to called Who Killed Mars Hill? It is stunning. It's sad. It's about really the tragic things that unfolded at Mars Hill Church uh, several years ago, pastored by a man named Mark Driscoll, and just the, the kind of pride that came in there. It, it, it is a cautionary tale to any pastor and any Christian. But frankly, the list is long of gifted and talented proclaimers of the word of God who it turned out were self-seeking, self-serving, self-promoting rather than Christ-honoring. I do not mind calling his name because this is public record and uh, there was a man years ago when I was uh, young, I heard a, a man named Daryl Gilliard preach and I thought, my goodness, that, that guy could preach the stars down. But later when he went to prison, for sexually abusing underage girls in his church. Uh, it, it, was, it was beyond heart-wrenching and uh, just so painful to see that someone could stand in the pulpit and preach with such giftedness and yet hide such horrible secret sins. But here's the amazing thing. When he got out of prison, he immediately began pastoring a church and the attendance at that church jumped tenfold. As I preach today, he's pastoring and preaching a church in Jacksonville, Florida, as a convicted sex offender. And 
there are, if you get someone gifted enough and charismatic enough, there will always be a crowd that will gather because they like him or her. Paul says we are not peddlers of the word of God like so many. We are commissioned by God. And I would say you've got to look at someone's track record. Look at what they have produced. Look at those that have served with them. One cannot embellish, deny, fake, or produce a track record of genuine lives changed by the gospel. It's either there or it's not. You've got to ask, what have they done? Where are the disciples they've produced, the churches they've planted, the marriages that have been healed, the baptisms celebrated, the men and women taught the word of God and brought into closer walk with the, the Lord? Man, how is it that the people of God can be so easily seduced to follow someone based only on their gifts instead of on their gospel? We have a divine commission, even though we have human inadequacy. Paul says, who's sufficient for these things? We're not sufficient. But don't you see, that's the very thing that qualifies Paul and disqualifies his opponents because they think they are sufficient and he knows he is not. Paul's rivals are claiming their competence and sufficiency, sufficiency, which Paul practically mocks when he says, who's sufficient for these things? Who is sufficient to comfort a grieving couple when they've lost a baby? Who is sufficient to give hope to a dying man? Who is sufficient to preach good news in a graveyard? Who is sufficient to preach liberty to captives and recovering of sight to the blind? Who's sufficient to preach to the dead, dry bones of depraved humanity and see them come alive at the preaching of the gospel and the application of the word by the Holy Spirit? We're insufficient, but the good news is that our insufficiency is the very thing that drives us to Christ's sufficiency. It's when we realize just how desperately broken we are, how incapable we are, that we run to him. And any kind of self-promoting, pull yourself up by the bootstraps, health and wealth gospel is a false gospel. My sin makes me see my desperate need of his holiness, my selflessness, my, excuse me, my selfishness makes me long for his selflessness. My weakness makes me need his strength. My fear makes me crave his faith. My alienation makes me desire his fellowship. That is how we serve. We serve as those who have been commissioned by God. We're not out to impress. We're not out to try and change the fragrance and the aroma of Christ. We, we're just letting it come through us. And when some respond and they say, oh, that's life unto life, and others respond and they say, no, that's death unto death. We're not changing the message. We're not changing the strategy. We're just continuing to preach and to live the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's how we serve. That's what this church is about. And man, I tell you what, I, I am, there's a lot of things I've been disheartened about in recent days, but man, when, if you go into a church and the first questions you're asking are about what they did during COVID or what they think about critical race theory or what they do about this or that, and your first question is not about what they believe about the gospel, you are misguided. It is the gospel of Jesus Christ that matters above all other things. It will shape those other things but it's the thing that matters. That's how we serve, but you know what else? It's that gospel we preach, the reality that we're lost and that we cannot save ourselves, that there is nothing we can do to re regenerate ourselves, to make our dry bones live. There's nothing we can do to make our sinful self holy. There's nothing we can do to please God or appease God or to get rid of the stain of sin that makes us come to Jesus Christ 
and to cast ourselves upon him for his mercy. And if today you realize that you have never come to him in genuine faith, you have never put your trust in him alone for salvation. You've been trusting in your church membership or your baptism or your own goodness, but you've not been trusting in Christ. I hold out one thing to you, and that's the salvation that God offers you in Jesus Christ. That is not only how we serve, that's how we're saved.